I'm delighted to welcome you all here. I'm Raymond Blaschwitz. I'm Chair in Sustainable Global Resources and the Director of the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources. And my main purpose today is to chair one of the exciting UCL Lunch Minds session. And the today's one is with Dr. Catalina Spataru, who is standing here next to me. And her topic is about the power of islands. And uh, she has written a book about it, actually. And you might have a chance to read through the book and to also give you a bit of a background about Catalina. Uh, Catalina works as an associate professor um, in energy system dynamics and the nexus. That's more or less the title uh, in the department that I'm heading. Um, and she has been uh, written a lot on system dynamics, on energy systems in particular, but she also has done round about 90 other publications on all sorts of things. And the latest idea is actually the islands. And I leave it to her, to Catalina, to explain why islands are interesting and fascinating and what stories are attached to it and what tools can be used to analyze the resilience of islands. So welcome again to all of you here and over to you, Catalina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming here, especially in such a good weather outside. <laughs> so bon appetit for those which you, you have a lunch. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the power of islands. So, um, I'm the head of the islands laboratory at UCL, and I'm an associate professor on global energy and resources. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of hidden history, be, uh, captivating history for many islands. And in the previous couple of hundreds of years, some islands served as uh, military reservation, training purpose, immigration station, and so on. So many roles and many different uh, things. Uh, here, just to mention two examples, the Nutmeg Island was traded for Manhattan by Dutch in 1677 to the British, mainly because they were sole source of nutmeg, which was one of the most valuable commodities in Western Europe in that time. So basically, largely because they set on a valuable natural resource, so they were traded. Another example I picked up was, uh, is Angel Island um, because of a geographical location. Uh, it was mainly used as an immigration station to control entries to passengers from Asia to US, and today is a state park. But I'm not going to talk about the hidden history of fascinating hidden history of many islands, what I'm going to talk about challenges and how we are, what we are doing here at UCL about these challenges. So here just to mention a couple of great challenges island suffers in this moment, climate change is one of them, waste from tourism and cruise ships, another one, plastic in oceans, lack of investment. So these are just few of these big challenges. And here we have Maldives, uh, which, according with the World Bank, will, uh, could submerge by uh, 2100. So Maldives is really at high risk because of a high level uh, sea level, high sea level rise. Um, Marshall Islands also, similarly to Maldives, uh, is placed in a position of intense risk in terms of exposure to effect of climate change. And sea level uh, has been ri uh, rising by 3.0 millimeters per year. And the water supply was being salinated by the flux of seawater. And at the moment, um, the mitigation action which is taking is relocation of a population. Another uh, great challenge is, uh, is faced by Tuvalu in this moment, again, because of a sea level rise. And what is really considering as a mitigation action is very much resettlement plans. So in other words, it's without us to take substantial and sustained reduction of greenhouse gas emission and really to tackle climate change globally, not only in some places, we will experience more extreme weather events and sometimes with high consequences. And we already see here a couple of uh, extreme uh, cases. 
Another great, great uh, uh, challenge is um, plastic, so marine litter. It's really growing uh, as a global problem. Every year we have an average of about 8 million tons of plastic waste, which ends up in sea. In other words, a truck of waste every minute. Uh, it is estimated also like uh, between 80 and 95 percent of waste that enters the rivers, seas and estuaries, thus uh, so from the land. So, but this has mm, other consequences. So the marine life, uh, like seabirds and turtles, often uh, mistake the floating plastic for food. And this plastic affects more than our oceans. Actually, it also have effects on our uh, health, on human health. And especially through the seafood we are eating and so on. And here, just to give you an idea about what, what it means in terms of years, from plastic bag which lasts 20 years to fishing lines which last 600 years. So you see, many of this can be uh, changed and we need to take action and we need to, to do something ourselves as well. So what we are doing here uh, at UCL? We came up with this idea with Islands Laboratory. Um, so we really try to put together multidisciplinary team, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. So we currently we have, I have 14 active researchers, many collaborators. We are working on several case studies on Greek islands, Turkish islands, Bahamas, Scottish islands, and so on. And we are very much trying to answer and to find some answers to some of the problems which I mentioned, and to think a little bit uh, behind the normal boundaries of our thinking through these multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches. So solutions are not only technical, actually are also uh, policies involves also policies mixes, business model, governance structure, uh, communities engagement. So we need to really engage uh, together. So what uh, is our experience? So let's say about equivalent of 85 percent years of experience in insular areas. We cover more than 400 islands case studies. And very much we focus on energy, low carbon technologies, modeling of energy systems, uh, resource nexus, water energy, land, materials and food, uh, the trades off between them, uh, sustainability goals, uh, impact on, uh, so we model different scenarios under different climatic conditions. We looked at very much resilience and equality uh, and then we try to define solutions which can help the governments to define policies and to define uh, planning and to take decision for design. We aim to combine different methods and also to understand how we could uh, transform islands in golden spots for sustainability to help communities and businesses and also to demonstrate how they could actually play a different role, the central po point uh, for energy and resource use. So we detected around 1,900 small islands with a total population of approximately 20 million people. Global islands population is about 740 million. 3% uh, of the islands population is living on small islands. We are not covering only all small islands, we are really focusing on islands nations. Um, almost half of the small islands are located within the Pacific Ocean. The second most islands can be found on Atlantic and Arctic Ocean. And then is the Indian Ocean with about 319 and the Caribbean with about 100 islands. And Med Mediterranean area about 93. Some islands have higher generation cost because of a uh, remote, uh, remoteness. Um, and also they have higher costs because transport cost of many uh, transport cost. Um, other islands has more uh, potential for renewable energies, energies, some for more for solar energy, others for wind energy, for geothermal and so on. 
Uh, so it's very much sometimes is like tailor-based solutions. Our time is more to learn from each other and then combining the solutions. So what we try is to optimize, for example, in terms of energy, to optimize, to optimize uh, energy resources and to look also at the trade-offs between different resources. So we just we don't look only at energy, but we look at the whole system and try to understand where actually changes should be made. So this is just a little bit about what we are currently focused on. So we focus on free research uh, in three main research areas, energy resource nexus and circular economy. Energy system uh, includes all sectors and also we look at the interconnection between islands, also interconnection between islands and mainland. Uh, we also focus on microgrids, um, climate events, scenarios, and we look at uh, climate events. Um, we look at scenarios analysis. Uh, in terms of resource allocation, we look, for example, resource allocation in case of disasters, man-made and climate-driven, and also we look at how to mitigate risk reduction and resilience. Um, for circular economies, uh, circular economy, we look at waste to energy primary, how we can convert waste into energy, and um, we look at uh, also trade-offs between resources because it's not only one single issue, we have actually many more. These are the current projects we are running in this moment. So Greek non-interconnected islands, Turkish islands, uh, Scottish islands, we system the, uh, to uh, convert them in system to circular resource hub. We have a project on mobile education hub for system the islands and circular islands. And in top of that, Teaching. So our two modules, Smart Energy System and Matrix Modeling Visualization of Resource Nexus, where students have the possibilities to pick up a case study and then to use the models developed uh, part of the laboratory and then to input the data and assess the case studies. So why islands? Because, and why a laboratory on islands? It's mainly because they are highly dependent on fossil fuels. High cost of electricity production as well they are facing. They are facing many uh, challenges, as I showed you a little bit earlier. So just to have to look as an example, European Union. So 2,700 islands in European Union, population nearly 15 million. So what European Union needs to do is to compensate uh, the high cost of electricity production and dependence on fossil fuels, um, about 3 billion euros annually. So why not to use this number and this figure to actually help to invest in these islands and transform them? Another issue is impact on tourism and in natural resources. So, Land resources and land biological diversity, for example, uh, including vegeta vegetation and wildlife, uh, all are threatened but because of a large tourism infrastructure and facilities. And we already seen that, for example, Thailand, Phuket area, and many other islands. There is a really strong competition between tourism and other sectors, agriculture, recreation areas, and so on, in, in small regions especially. And because of a lack of areas, to lack of land areas to accommodate uh, these tourists. Um, increased land prices, another issue, deforestation, loss of biological diversity. So all these are today problems. Waste management. I already mentioned a bit of waste. So for small islands, for example, waste treatment and disposal is a significant challenge. And this really requires support urgently. So, but it's, so I'm talking about waste generated from tourism, especially the marine life and coastal regions. Uh, high volumes of waste disposal we already seen generated by tourist sector. Additionally, we've seen pollution from ship generated waste in additional significant pollution source for islands. I understood that in some 
islands actually the uh, waste from the ships are just dumped in the islands without any cost to be paid for it. So actually that could be changed you know, through some regulation or global rules. Uh, so yeah, so we have different factors and which we definitely need to do something about it, uh, which requires some immediate actions. And some of these are institutional. So some of the institution needs to change the way they are thinking, talk more with communities and engage with communities. Uh, legislative and informal capacities in some cases this needs to be more clear and put in place. Uh, we have also some lack of, we identify also lack of regional consensus in some cases, uh, especially on some um, problems like sewage, coastal water standards and so on. So all these are uh, problems which we need to look ahead. Um, we need to focus more on energy efficiency and renewables and to pick up the best technologies which are available in that moment. So what we are doing, so we are actually looking, we develop mathematical models to look at different scenarios, to assess some of these problems. We uh, collect data, as I said, we have more than 400 cases which we have been collecting data for. And in top of that, we are organizing um, so, uh, we are organizing workshops, engage with communities. We also do survey and questionnaire and interviews so we can understand how we can tackle these problems. So in terms of methods, uh, this is an example of Isla model, one of my baby, let's say. <laughs> so it's very much like focusing on energy and the animation shows you how to optimize the system under different weather conditions. We cover all the, uh, um, all the we cover demand and supply, and also we cover uh, all sectors. So very much is an integrated all system modeling, which can give you an idea about how the future could look with different options. Another uh, and this, you can see some of the uh, examples we've done. Uh, so we have here three different islands, the baseline year, which was 2016. And we have the energy mix on these islands. And here is 2050, uh, the energy mix, how it's going to look. So you see, we have like scenarios where we look at renewables and so on. So, it different, you see that the options are different, so uh, this varies, depends on the size of islands, depends on the options, so, so you really need to do like a complete uh, study to determine that. So, of course, there are different options and it's possible to make these changes. So just to give you an idea about what like, if we have like 100 uh, kilowatt power of solar, that will be the equivalent of 44 tons of diesel fuel saved per year. So things can be changed significantly and carbon emission could go down significantly as well. Um, this is demand. So we can't look only at supply. We can't look only at energy generation, but we need also to look at demand because demand is changing as well. In some islands we've seen already like some demand increase because of a, a transport, for example, or because of a tourism. Uh, especially it varies from season to season, low season, high season, um, but also demand could change because of activities, commercial activities or some industrial activities, some industries are closing down or some others are uh, putting in place and so on. So we need to look at both. So if you go on the website, you'll find the one which is in red, you can click on it and you can see those changes. One in red, we are planning to put them, so it will be more uh, soon, and you will see all the uh, 400. Um, so, good uh, islands practices. We identify a couple of them, especially like, as I mentioned, uh, um, we work on Greece, on Turkish islands. So, some examples we identify, of good practices already which exist is, for example, in Tilos, uh, 
uh, island in Greece. They already installed PV wind and battery system. And that was very much with grant support. In Bozgata, in Turkish islands, we have through support with feeding tariffs, already like 10.2 megawatts of wind has been uh, installed and summertime is like using eight megawatts in peak time in summertime and two megawatts is actually exported to the mainland. So this is why I'm saying is like, if you do well and you implement this uh, solutions in these islands, actually they can become exporters. They can become these golden spots you know, for the mainland and help also. And another one is interconnection of the Cycladic Islands. This was a big project uh, and you can see in the picture like the existing uh, cables and the next steps and so on in steps. And it depends. Interconnection could work, depends on the uh, scale, depends on the distances between islands. In some cases, it's not worse to look, so it's better to look at microgrids, for example. So, so just uh, to give you a bit, so we, we go and we analyze, we do more in-depth analysis. So just an idea of, for example, of uh, energy cost on islands, uh, for Greek islands in this case, so uh, the first uh, graph, the one on emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, shows that the interconnection scenarios actually um, demonstrate the most sustainability options across the decades. And the interconnection scenario with high renewable energy um, attains a decrease of about 57% uh, somewhere here. Um, in total of greenhouse gas emission by 2040 and comparing to 2020 and is about like 70 percent uh, comparing with the 1990 levels. So the second the autonomous scenario actually recorded the highest emission level according with our study. Um, because actually it doesn't allow for wind offshore large-scale deployment. So it exceeds the interconnection uh, scenario by more than 35 um, uh, uh, tons of CO2 emissions in aggregated terms between 2020 and 2040. So, but as I said, interconnection not works all the time, so sometimes just you need to look at microgrades. Another example is the generation mix for different scenarios with different uh, install capacity and average generation prices for different scenarios. And then here we look also, we do statistics. So this is for load statistics for Greek islands between 2020 and 2040, for example. And here you can see the seasonal um, across the years, daily and monthly distribution of a sample of Greek islands. It varies, depends on the season, um, and also depends on the hourly average. A second uh, model we have in Islands Laboratory, let's say second baby, <laughs> is EDA Free 5 model. Um, so it's very much is a dynamic uh, model uh, of water energy land which we can analyze the trade-offs between resources under different climatic conditions. And we can capture some of this dynamic between resources. And very much uh, the resource nexus uh, originates in the interconnections between different resources. And um, for example, uh, from the requirement of one resource as an input, you can produce another from the uh, substitutability of the two or more resources. So very much we take a resource nexus approach in, in a more integrated view because it allow us to better understand this resource related question that sometimes is really difficult to answer in more traditional way. So in more general terms, uh, resource Resources serves as a direct or functional inputs in the production process of another resource, or they can also substitute the use of another resource. So the indirect effects also have to be taken into account. So claims for one resource 
can compete with our useful demands. <laughs> so as an example is land use, um, either for the production of food or for bioenergy, for example. So some of the strategic implications, climate action. So climate action definitely should be embedded in broader strategies of sustainable resource management. A second one is how we manage non-renewable resources. And this is really key to sustainable development. So, but it's not only energy, it's also about water and food security and land use. And then a third point is about resource efficiency. This is really a key to turn those challenges into business, businesses and also to develop more opportunities. So it could be like waste to energy, you know, could be pro products you know, from plastic to be transformed and reused in products. And this could be the role of uh, startup companies to pick up to, to be in the market. So we looked a bit more at other good islands practices. So across the globe are not only challenges, but actually some of the islands are really, they, they really try uh, to do, and they do really well. So this is an example. So in uh, uh, the islands of Capraia, um, in, uh, so what they do is actually it's the first island which was doing uh, switch to biodegradable wishing, uh, fishing coolers, boxes, you see here, like, boxes, to reduce the marine litter. So this is the only, the first island which has been taken this. Then another example is uh, this island, which uh, what they did is install solar power station and storage on a coral cay. And actually it was a very difficult place to manage, uh, but they managed. Another one is uh, San Patelemi in France, and this one, Marta Vineyard in Island in US. So both of them, um, so this one has a small runaway, uh, so only small aircraft can land, keep it tourist controlled, so they really don't uh, allow, uh, they minimize. Um, then this one, uh, it's very much like um, living around like 100,000 people to go on violence. So it's quite selective. Then another uh, good practice is Barbados. It's a really good example because they consider the electrical vehicle, and actually they are considered as an electrical vehicle paradise. And um, they also created a battery lab, and they use the end-of-life uh, EV batteries of renewable energy storage. And another example is Palau, which ho uh, is hosting the biggest microgrid in the world. Right, so what is our vision? So very much is transferring knowledge from one island to another island. So capacity building design of decarbonization plans. So there are broad similarities, but they need to be documented. So uh, for example, the same transition pathways that are implemented in violence in Mediterranean Sea, for example, will not work or may not work for islands located in Scotland. Sometimes you need to come up with this kind of tailor uh, solution. Uh, you can, we, we try to create catalogs of current energy activities and also to understand current energy um, uh, view in uh, current situation of energy and also resource use in these islands. But also we try to look at policies and regulation to see what are the incentives programs or what are the kind of um, bilateral, multilateral development patterns in, in those islands. We try also to get in touch with communities and to get help from them. To be honest, I, usually we get the data from these islands. So one of the, uh, we also need to refer to integra integrated um, models. So it's not only like new mo business models on communities. So it could be new business models where communities are involved in that one. So 
Um, we can look at low carbon technologies, storage, microgrids, as well as other big solutions which could be uh, supported by the governments and other uh, institutions. Uh, another important aspect is islands actually can fu function as test beds for the deployment of innovative uh, integrated solution, solutions. And this could be, for example, low carbon technologies, increase of renewable energy, use of energy storage, information communication technologies. Um, so really to maximize uh, the synergies between the energy transport, water and waste management, for example. So testing these solutions could then be implemented in other generally geographical isolated areas of the mainland, such as small municipalities or mountains area or rural area. So there are many synergies we identify between islands and villages, islands and cities. It really depends on the size, location and different conditions, climate conditions and so on. But one of the most important is how we make them more self-sufficient, sustainability, how we use their local resources use for the benefit of communities and local communities, how we engage local participation of local employment, community and agreement. So some of opportunities for improvement and what we can, uh, what can be done to improve the current situation uh, is uh, we, we, we very much like grouped into four sets of opportunities. In summary, we have like um, uh, political and economic barriers which have the highest importance, while the highest variance was found in barriers related to the um, uh, category market failure, for example, distortion on fossil and fossil fuel lobby. Uh, and this includes also the lack of regulatory framework and legislation for private investors, the lack of legal framework for independent power producers and power purchase agreements, uh, some of the gaps which exist in the targets and implementation. Another one is cost and financing. So cost and financing are uh, main barriers, uh, like high initial cost, um, high transaction cost, lack of incentives and subsidies and support from governments and uh, in some cases. Land use competition on islands is another issue. Lack of understanding of the project cash flows uh, from financing institutions, so lack of private capital, for example. So all these other overcoming, uh, overcoming all these barriers uh, is really important to take to the next step towards more renewable energies and more use of resource empty resources. So, and the key one is building resilience and quality. So we really need to think about more about communities how we build up resilience and equality in these communities. And I'm going to close with some recommendation for the sustainability uh, transition. So um, to provide some ideas about inclusive solution while taking benefits of existing measures and initiatives. And some of these are provide incentives for energy liberalization, develop dedicated business model, um, help more young people, startup companies to come up with ideas, get the support, improve the legislation and procedures, uh, engage more with local communities, local employment, community agreement, establish mechanisms, not only at local level, but also establish uh, mechanisms at global level, as you've seen the problem of waste from ships, for example, and establish resilience mechanisms. Thank you. So there is scope now for questions and answers, for questions from your side. I might kick it off myself. I mean, I thought the sort of energy storyline is really very strong, and it also matches with lots of what you have done in the previous years. How strong would you say is this narrative and the evidence of cutting down on the current energy cost by smart systems like feed and tariffs, and could then the emergence of renewable energies also be used to really reach out for other solutions 
or does there need to be like a stronger emphasis on water or plastic challenges? So how do you look at the sort of uh, superiority, the sort of strengths of the energy transition in comparison to some of the other challenges that you're facing? Mm. Uh, correct. So uh, there are islands, depends on the location, geographic mm. location of islands. Some islands uh, do suffer more because of a plastic pollution. You would think so so yes. definitely, this yeah. is like an urgent thing which needs to be improved. But there are ways to integrate these resources, you know, so water energy, for example, you know, or use of land. You know? So if you build up, for example, west a uh, plant to create waste to energy, then you need also to maybe do a trade between land use for agriculture and land use for energy purpose. Yeah. But it's in the benefit of the, so, of the community. So it, it really depends. So it depends geographically, depends of urgent problems they face currently. So yeah, renewable energy, we already seen like fossil fuels, most of them like a high percentage mm. actually rely on fossil fuels. So definitely this is an urgent problem also. But it can be done in a different way with help from communities as well. So yes, and it's, it's definitely no also good solutions. to see well, the, uh, the modeling capabilities developed. And I would encourage all of you to take a look at the website. 450 cases have been collected so far, and there are more in the pipeline. So I'm pretty sure what you just mentioned is something you can discover while looking at the website. So who wishes to have a word, ask a question, or share some insights here? Um, so is energy liberalization um, just more to, to do with like the biggest thing you would suggest is just reducing the subsidies for fossil fuels and then shifting subsidies towards more renewable energy or are there other things that we could add to the product policies? Indeed, some of the islands really, they, are, they receive subsidized very much fossil fuels. Definitely, if you do reduce that or completely cut it down, then, but you need to support in parallel to provide subsidies for renewable energy, then things could change period, uh, like step by step, not immediately, will be a little bit high prices at the beginning and so on because you need to make an investment and so on. But with help from the governments or more international help from our institutions and so on, then that could help like step by step in long term will be beneficial. So uh, for sure, yeah. Institution, uh, also companies, uh, communities really it needs to be this kind of engagement between and we've seen already some great initiatives for the past 10 years or so so but we need to speed up a little bit for things to really happen at the ground thank you yes thank you uh, just to ask are you seeing any examples of island economies controlling um, the packaging <coughs> excuse me of um, materials coming into their own economies um, as, a, as a means of reducing what has to eventually leave or get landfilled or, or dumped in some way? Mm. Good question. <laughs> Good question. I mean, we've seen like, I wouldn't call them exactly islands, but yeah. Indonesia and Malaysia exactly. have been coping with some of the plastic imports following the Chinese strong policies. And as far as I know, they have adopted policies to ban the imports of plastic waste into their uh, territory. And that probably captures some of the islands there. Thailand as well. So. And yeah. I'm not thinking so much of the waste. I'm thinking of primary products coming products. in for use on an island. You ah. know, is there a way, are there any islands um, you know, legislating, mandating, controlling the ways in which goods are imported into their own economies to reduce waste, you know, at source, so to speak? I, I'm aware, for example, in Thailand, mm. recently <clears throat> they put a regulation in place to cut the plastic bags. Mm. So they do not accept anymore. The regulation is going to be soon in place. So yeah, but not particular products. Yeah, I mean, there might be an issue with WTO because it yeah. would have an impact on the production practices. Exactly. But on the other hand, you would think many of these islands, they run like tourist hotspots mm. and they have a purchasing policy. And you would think that indeed they are strong enough to require 
that whoever supplies products to them follows certain standards. So in practical terms, I would think that the purchasing power is relatively high, in particular in those islands where you have like a visible tourism industry, exactly. maybe in others too. I am aware of some resorts, or mm -hmm. equal resorts, which actually mm -hmm. they do not accept anything like baggage very much. They mm -hmm. accept everything like in big box. So, yeah, yeah option can happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm, so I'm wondering about the energy supply of the countries, the islands located in the Pacific, so for instance, Tuvalu or Kiribati. Mm -hmm. where, where, does the energy, where is the energy coming from? Is it already locate, um, sorry, produced locally, mostly? Or is it coming from one country especially, or several, several countries? Uh, it really depends if they are interconnected or not, or depends if they bring the diesel, for example, through ships. You know, so it really depends. So you can also like go for the microgrids option. Yeah, so you can have also like solar PV with uh, a solar thermal, you know, a bit combination of a microgrid. Or it depends what option you want. If you have interconnections like in the Greek islands, for example, some of them, then yes, if you uh, invest, for example, in wind and solar, but a larger scale, so you can have, for example, solar farms, you know, and then you can uh, export that to the mainland or vice versa. When you have a deficit of it, you can import from the mainland. So because solar and uh, it's volatile. Um, hi, um, I would like to ask, because we were just talking about the self-sufficiency in energy sector, is there also a new trend you see in terms of, for example, food systems or other, yeah, like food would be a part where I would be interested in. If there is, a, like, since like sustainability is discussing also other um, areas, uh, do you see a shift there also to think more about to source locally and become more self dependent? Uh, self -independent? It, it really depends on, yeah, geographical location, climate conditions, and very much like size of islands and opportunities in terms of land use and so on. So, I'm in favor of local food production, but sometimes reality is not like that. You need to import food, <laughs> and we've seen already these cases. So it's but it's not a new strategy. Like it's not a pillar. For example, now rethinking maybe the food supply in in the islands, like where possible, obviously, but. It varies a lot. So some produce the food in their islands. Some do import the food. It really depends on geographical location. Uh, I was just curious. Um, uh, building a uh, renewable energy industry uh, will need land use and um, possibly destroying the native um, eco ecosystem. So um, just wanted to make sure. And deforestation also has mm -hmm. negative impact on uh, global um, warming. So I was curious whether, the, whether people, whether there's a certain limit as to how much land the industry will take place mm. or will they keep on expanding? <laughs> okay, so it depends really. You can have also solar PV on the roofs of the, every individual building. You no, know, you can also, uh, you can have a combination you know, of solar farms, for example, and then yes, <clears throat> you do need to have a trade between land use for uh, solar energy and land use for agriculture. Uh, but we really need to think about how we tackle climate change, how will we really reduce the carbon emissions. You know? So if we continue to use fossil fuels, you know, and especially like transporting ships, you know, through ships like fossil fuels and so on, then you need to make a trade you know? so between land use mm. and renewable energy. Well, I mean, the point probably still is really interesting in that when a developer to said at the end, this resilience strategy, mm -hmm. you might have higher economic cost for the current subsidies of fossil fuels, yes. and you might instead have higher environmental costs if you do it wrong exactly. with like the land use change. And there's indeed like in general a good point but it's also probably where your model becomes interesting because I understand that much of the trade-offs can be dealt with by your modeling approach, mm -hmm. probably following some surveys you are doing. 
Exactly. So mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So we can provide technically mm -hmm. an idea, and also we can look at various scenarios and so on to picture a little bit how it's going to look. But uh, then you really need to talk with communities, then to look at for policies, for regulation which exists there and so on, and then to combine them. Okay. I understand. We <laughs> need to close. Is that correct? I'm following also some advice <laughs> guidance here. So the last question that you might have had in mind, you might just approach Catalina directly. Uh, I also had a question in mind, and I would probably just <laughs> uh, pose it here, uh, because it's more an invitation to the audience here. We talked through the data requirements to run all these case studies, and it would probably be interesting, thinking that the data is just not available in many of the international databases. There's a point where students or others might engage with you and helping not just with data collection, but really to help you with the exciting research to tackle those, uh, those eminent questions. So thanks a lot. Thanks in particular to Catalina, but also thanks to all of you for coming and thanks for, to UCL for hosting us here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>